Hi, welcome to Constitutional Chats, hosted by me, Janine Turner, and Kathy Gillespie, with students, Dakari Chapman, and me, Tova Kaplan. Join us as we discuss hot topic issues with constitutional experts. It's sponsored by Constituting America. everyone. Welcome to Constituting America's Constitutional Chats. We're so glad you're here with us today and want to give you a second to come on in. And while you are coming in, we are going to ask Jacob to put up our poll and find out a little bit about who's in the audience today. Jacob, do you want to pull the poll up? Yep, pulling that up right now. And I want to introduce Jacob. Yeah, there's our poll and you can indicate if you are a student, a teacher, a parent or grandparent with children, donor, press, family, friend, fan, however you want to categorize yourself. And that just helps us know who's in our audience. I want to thank Jacob for running our media today. Aubrey's out today, but we are so uh, grateful to have Jacob with us standing in for her. Jacob works as a strategic manager, as, as strategic manager for Constituting America, specializing in advertising and social media. He graduated from Brigham Young University with a Bachelor of Arts in Communications in the nationally top-ranked advertising program. Jacob is a former winner of Constituting America's We the Future contest. He was raised in Utah, where he currently lives with his wife, Emily, who also works for Constituting America. They're a great team, and Emily is also a former contest winner. And one of the really uh, great things about Constituting America, I think, is that we involve our former winners in so many different ways. And Jacob, thank you so much for being with us today. Do you want to say hello? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, thank you. It's it's uh, an honor to work for Constituting America, and uh, it's a lot of fun to work on more of the back end of things with the advertising and social media. But it's also great when I get to dabble in the the chats a little bit as well. These are a lot of fun. Well, great. And do you want to give us a little bit of a a preview of what percentage our audience is in the different categories? Sure thing. Um, so our our largest category. Uh, with 27% of our viewers right now are actually just jumped up to 30% are parents and grandparents with children. So we're glad that uh, there's a lot of you out there. And our next base is actually teachers. We've got 15% of the audience uh, in the teacher category. And then our next two largest categories, each with 4% are middle and high school students, as well as some of our donors in the, in the hey. audience. Well, welcome to everyone and, and welcome especially to the teachers and students and, and parents uh, and grandparents with children. We're all we're so glad that y'all are here. I want to go ahead and introduce the rest of our panel right now and then I'll get to our very special guest, author Tony Williams. But first, I'm going to introduce uh, Janine Turner, who's going to be joining us a little bit later today. Janine is famous for her role as Maggie O'Connell in television's Northern Exposure. Janine is founder and co-president of Constituting America, which launched in 2010. She's still acting, but is also actively teaching kids about the U.S. Constitution, having given over 540 speeches to classrooms across the country. And we'll be so glad to welcome Janine when she comes on, and, and I'm sure she'll be uh, speaking with us a little bit later in just, in just a few minutes. So I'm going to go on now to Tova Kaplan. Tova is a 17-year-old student from Chicago, Illinois. She's a three-time winner of the We the Future contest. Tova is National Youth Director of Constituting America and runs our Youth Advisory Board. Tova is passionate about inspiring young people to know and use their constitutional rights. Tova, would you like to say hello? Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, so happy to be here as always. It's always such a bright spot in my week. Um, and I hope you all enjoy the show today. Oh, great. Thank you so much, Toa. I also want to introduce Jewel Gilbert. Jewel uh, is, is with us today. Jorn, his brother, is usually with us, but Jorn is out today as well. Jewel is executive producer uh, of Sing for America. Jorn is operations director. 
They're a family-based company that the brothers co-founded. Sing for America seeks to show the art of truth and light through live performance. And both are proud former We the Future contest winners. Sing for America is an actor-run theater company, which specializes in semi-professional musicals, private training in the arts, school drama solutions, and public entertainment events, all the while revealing a colorblind world on stage. Jewel and Jorn are graduates of Moravian College, where they each earned a BA in musical performance and dramatic production. Uh, Jewel, would you like to say hello today? Hello, everybody. Happy to be back. After last week, we were gone in San Antonio, and we missed the show. So this week, we're looking forward to it. Um, this was a shorter letter that we read this time, but it was definitely very powerful from the Anti-Federalist. Well, great. We're, we're glad to have you back. Now, before I introduce Tony Williams, I want to thank our sponsor today, Mr. Van Hildreth, PMP, which stands for Project Management Professional. Mr. Hildreth is from Montana and is a heavy civil construction project manager. Now, one of the ways that Mr. Hildreth contributes to Constituting America is by utilizing a matching program through his employer. And we encourage you all to check with your employers and see if they have a similar program. And please consider a gift to Constituting America, uh, especially if you can do so through your employer matching fund, as Mr. Hildreth does. Now, Mr. Hildreth is also a big supporter of Constituting America's online auctions. We want to ask everyone to mark your calendars for our next auction, which is November 11th through the 18th. So if you have an item to donate, please email me at Kathy at constitutingamerica.org. That's Kathy with a C, C-A-T-H-Y at constitutingamerica.org. I also wanted to mention that Mr. Hildreth contacted a local radio show host to make him aware of Constituting America's programs. So we're grateful for that publicity that, that Mr. Hildreth brings to us. And Mr. Hildreth, we just want to thank you for all the ways that you so generously support Constituting America's programs. The students we serve are blessed by your support. So thank you for sponsoring today's program. Now we will get to our special guest who is going to be joining us today on the topic of the role of the first branch. We're going to be looking at Brutus III and Federalist 55. Now, if you're in our audience and you are thinking, I wish I had read those papers, if you want to go to our website at constitutingamerica.org, scroll down a little bit and click learn more on today's episode, we have those two papers hyperlinked so that you can click on them and, and maybe scan through them real quick. But uh, Tony Williams is our guest and he is a senior fellow at the Bill of Rights Institute in Arlington, Virginia which, by the way, is a great organization, and we encourage you all to check out the Bill of Rights Institute. Now, Tony is the author of six books, including Washington and Hamilton, The Alliance that Forged America, and Hamilton, an American Biography. Tony's presently writing a book on the Declaration of Independence. He lives with his wife and children in Williamsburg, Virginia. Tony is a frequent essayist in our 90 day study series, 90 and 90 equals 180, history holds the key to the future, having written over 83 essays for our studies over the last 11 years. And Tony is a frequent guest on our constitutional chat. So welcome back, Tony Williams. And we look forward to your opening comments on the role of the first branch, Brutus III and Federalist 55. Well, Kathy and, and Janine will be joining us. Thank you so much for having me back on to all the panelists, the, the, the donor, um, and, and all the viewers out there. It's, it's really a pleasure to come on the show and, and offer some thoughts uh, on, on these two important papers and, and what a great converse, you know, conversations that you've been having about these uh, Federalist and Anti-Federalist papers. Um, you know, and, and I really like these two because they, they really touched on something really central to the American experiment in self-government and liberty. Uh, and, and that is representation, right? Uh, the Congress, right? As, as you noted in the title, the first branch, right? The first branch is, is closest to the people. It makes the laws, it's representative uh, and as Madison says in, in another Federalist paper, 51, it's really in many ways the most powerful branch of government. Why? Because it makes those laws, because it is most, it is closest to the people. 
and therefore has significant power. And so what do they want to do with that power? They wanted to divide it, right? We have a bicameral Congress with two houses and dividing the power even of a representative branch because it was the most powerful branch made the law, uh, even you know, that branch could, um, you know, hold out the possibility of tyranny. So the idea about that power was to divide it. And, uh, you know, I think it's important to remember that the House is the only popularly elected branch of government in the national government at the time, right? Of course, uh, the president, electoral college, uh, judges are appointed. Uh, and the Senate before the 17th Amendment uh, was uh, were chosen by the state legislatures. Okay, so the House is is really uh, the branch of government that's that's really closest to the people. And the nature of this debate between Madison as Publius and probably uh, Robert Yates as Brutus was over that representation. Right, was over the nature of representation in Congress. Right. Uh, and because we have a republic, right, and, and not a democracy uh, as originally conceived by the founders, um, you know, they wanted to avoid those excesses of democracies, those, those passions uh, that, that democratic governments, uh, you know, often descended sort of into mob rule. And, and I thought Madison said it really well in, in Federalist 55, he has this, this famous and important quote reflection about human nature. He says, had every Athenian citizen been a Socrates, every Athenian assembly would still have been a mob, right? The idea that, you know, people uh, in, in direct democracy, are, you know, can be led astray by their passions, by their, their interests, by self-interest. So we needed a representative or Republican form of government, where those representatives, as Madison says in Federalist Paper number 10, will refine and enlarge, I love that phrase, they're going to refine and enlarge popular views, right? Uh, because occasionally, you know, especially in a large country or even in a small city state like Athens, the people had various interests, they had various passions, they could become, these passions could sway with the wind in a certain sense. And so those representatives would refine and enlarge, they would filter those views, right? They would provide that deliberative body uh, that would represent people. And rather than just having sort of every whim of the people satisfied, uh, it would, would filter those views um, for, for hopefully a more deliberative, more virtuous uh, Republican form of government. Uh, and, you know, just looking real quick at, at each of the papers, you know, as we're looking at also the powers of Congress, right, related to representat representation, you know, the, it's important to remember that the Federalists wanted to ex expand uh, not in an unlimited way, but expand those powers beyond the Articles of Confederation, right? Give Congress greater power of taxation, more ability to regulate interstate commerce, that kind of thing. And on the other hand, uh, the powers of Congress, as uh, were included in the Constitution, uh, greatly frightened the Anti-Federalists. They were greatly afraid of those powers of taxation and regulating the states and so forth. So they wanted a a more limited central government. In Federalist 55, uh, Madison, you know, addresses that idea of the number of representatives in, in the Constitution and, and in the first Congress as expected. And he says, look, you know, we don't want too few, right? Because we don't want the country just led by two or three representatives, right? That would uh, tend towards tyranny. And on the other hand, we can't have, you know, hundreds and hundreds or, or even thousands of, of representatives. That would just be too many and sort of become its own mob in a sense. He says the number is about right. And, he, and it was going to be 65 um, and, uh, in the House. And he said, look, this will grow with population. We're going to take a census in a few years and it's going to be every 10 years after that. And it's going to be about the right number 
to represent the, the will of the people and to filter that to refine and enlarge it. And he says, we're gonna have frequent elections. Okay, it's gonna be every two years, uh, not every year, like a lot of the anti-federalists wanted and like was happening in several of the states, but he wanted it to be every few years because he thought this would be, give a little greater sense of deliberation, uh, allow representatives to gain a little bit more experience. In the Senate, it was gonna be six years, so an even, an even longer tenure of office, just because, again, that sort of that experience, that, that desire to, to filter um, popular views. Um, and he says that, you know, there's no danger of, of the Congress combining with, with any other branch. And then again, he has another very important reflection on, on human nature. Maybe we can read it later, but I'll just summarize it right now. He, you know, he says basically the idea is just as we cannot just entirely trust human nature because of the flaws and sort of sinful nature of, of humans, but we must also have, on the other hand, a certain amount of trust, right? Republican government assumes a certain trust in our citizenry, right? They're, that they're capable and practice virtue as well. Uh, and so this sort of mixed view of human nature, uh, you know, allows one to have Republican government and yet have controls on power, okay? Brutus is gonna have a very different point of view. Uh, he's going to say that the new government is very unequal, uh, the representation is very inadequate, and, uh, there's, and he provides a few examples. One is, he says, the three-fifths clause, which is very interesting. He says that's going to give an unequal representation to the slave states. Their slaves are not really represented. They don't have a will of their own, and yet the southern states are going to, or the slave states are going to get more power because of that. He says that creates an inequality. He says in the Senate, the small states get just as many uh, senators as large Virginia with a big population or as much influence as very powerful Massachusetts. And he says that creates inequality even in the Senate. And he also finally, as, as, as one, of the, one of the last points, he says, you know, 65 persons representatives is just simply not enough people to represent this, this growing republic, right? From stretching from uh, Georgia uh, all the way up to New England and moving out west. He says 65 is, is not enough. It's inadequate. And those 65 are going to be subject to uh, you know, having the, the wealthy and influential elected. We're going to have sort of an oligarchy in this country. They're going to combine into this cabal, this conspiracy with the executive branch. And he says, this is just a recipe for tyranny and really disaster. Uh, and so I, I, I can't wait to uh, get everyone's questions and, and uh, uh, to think about a little bit more, dig in a little bit more on, on Madison and, and Brutus there, um, or, or just general questions about Congress as well. So thank you. Well, thank you, Tony. That was a great explanation and, and synopsis of, of both papers. And, you know, I really loved your emphasis on the first branch and explaining why it is known as the first branch. And when we're in schools, one of the things that we always make sure that we teach the kids is not just what the three branches are, but what order the founders put them in. And I think you explained really well that, that it's the first branch because it's closest to the people. Um, and along those lines, I was just curious, you know, when you talked about the Anti-Federalists wanting a term of, of Congress for one year, and the Federalists supported the term of Congress for two years. What, do you know, was that debated uh, at the Constitutional Convention? I mean, was there a strong argument made for a one-year term? And if so, what, what were some of the arguments in favor of a one-year term versus a two-year term? Yeah, I, I'm not sure it was a, a, a very important part of the, the, the deliberations at the convention, but, but people did raise it, and then people certainly raised it in the ratifying conventions, even, maybe even more importantly, and, and in the anti federalist essays. You know, especially in New England, although other states had a, had a tradition of annual elections, right? And the idea was that 
Um, you know, these representatives should come from the people. They should return to the people often. That, that gives representatives a, a better sense of the people and, and their, their current concerns and, and their will and, and their desires and, and their interests, you know, what, what they want is sort of measuring the voice of the people would be much easier. It would also be much harder to have tyranny, right? If you're constantly rotating an office and, you know, the idea is that no one would be there for, for a lifetime, right? It's sort of annual elections sort of is a, a sort of, you might want to say a, a sort of natural or, or built in, uh, you know, way to achieve term limits uh, in a sense. And it's just that those frequent elections were associated constantly in the minds of, of many American revolutionaries and founders at the time uh, with liberty, right? That that was the best way to preserve liberty is to return these representatives to the people frequently. Interesting. Well, I'm going to turn it over to Tova. Tova always has such great questions. Thank you so much. Yeah, this is really fascinating. Um, and I think it's just so great to learn about, you know, the first branch because, you know, we don't always focus so much on it. There's so much emphasis on, you know, the presidency and we don't really hear much about this, even though it's supposed to represent us the most. Um, so I was wondering, why do you think uh, the executive has seemed to gain so much power or prominence, at least in the minds of Americans, to the point where they're so concerned about everything the president or executive branch does, but might not be up to date on, you know, the laws that are being passed that directly affect them. Tova, always, always great questions. Uh, I love it. So thank you. Um, let me start off with just a, a quick little story from my own experience teaching uh, young people. You know, I had a, a student uh, when I was at, at my, the last school where I taught before I started working for, for the Bill of Rights Institute. And he said, Mr. Williams said, you've been talking about Congress uh, and, and how powerful it is and, and how in the president is too much, you know, you know, the president is sort of not seen as the first branch of government, but he said, you know, then why do we vote, you know, 50% of us or so vote for the president, but only about 10% of us vote for Congress during off year elections, right, when the president's not, not being elected. And he says, shouldn't it be the other way around, right? If the Congress is the most important branch of government that's representative of the people, shouldn't, wouldn't Americans want to come out and vote for them 50% or 60, 70, 80% and vote for the president only 10%? And I, I thought that was one of the most perceptive questions that I had ever gotten uh, as, as a teacher over 15 years. You know, it really was a great question. And I think the answer to your question, Tova, is that, you know, Beginning around the turn of the 20th century, particularly with, with the progressives, uh, you know, the, the, the federal bureaucracy uh, really started expanding, the, the power of the executive started expanding over a lot of different, and, and by today, almost all aspects of our lives, right? Not just the economy, but, you know, the regulatory state and the welfare state really impact us in our daily lives, probably dozens of different ways directly, right? And so nowadays, you know, if, if there's an oil spill or the price of gasoline or the economy's doing well, not doing well, whatever's happening, uh, you know, if there's, there's a natural disaster, um, you know, we always look to the president, right? We always look to the executive branch of government. We should be looking towards Congress, right? We should be looking towards our representatives um, to, to make laws and, and policies. But we, we've deferred, I think, entirely too much to uh, one branch of government. And I'm not sure that that's been very healthy in a lot of ways for our republic. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, uh, so, so the executive branch of government has just become extremely powerful uh, for the reasons I mentioned. And we've deferred to it, right? That's, that's the only branch of government we really look to, right? And meanwhile, we don't trust Congress at all, right? I think the polls show about 11% of people trust Congress. Uh, everything is, is completely backwards as your, as your question points out. 
Great, thank you. Um, and then, you know, obviously, America today is a very different country than when the founders first laid this out. We have many, many, many more people, and also women can vote, minorities can vote, and the, you know, demographics of America are different. So what do you think, you know, the relevancy of the system? Is it still just as relevant today, do you think? Or are there things that need to change? Do you think like the general principles are still just as applicable, even though we have a very different country? Mm -hmm. Another great question. Um, yeah, you know, I think particularly pertaining to Congress, uh, what we might uh, first immediately question is, you know, back then it was it was one one representative for about 30,000 people, right? And, and nowadays, I think it's up around 900,000 or so. And one could wonder, you know, are, are the representatives really that representative of us? Do they really know our will, right? Do they, do they really come from among us or is it as the anti-federalists feared kind of a quote unquote club of millionaires, you know? Um, it's, a, it's an interesting question. Um, I think today, with our technology, um, I, I think that representatives can have, you know, a certain pulse uh, of the people through polling, know what they think on whether it's abortion or gun control or, or other kind of the economy or foreign policy or what have you, um, you know, they can have a sense of their constituents, right? Uh, and they have a lot of aides who, who help them discern that um, well. So, so things have changed and the number of representatives per, per Americans, that ratio has, has changed dramatically. Um, but I'm not sure that it's really necessarily affected, um, you know, how well they can represent our views. Um, and, and that's debatable, right? Uh, we, we can certainly talk about that and, and, and discuss that further. Um, you know, I think the other thing is uh, we do have a more diverse Congress, right? Um, and uh, maybe it's not perfectly representative of the numbers in society, but it's increasingly diverse and, and more and more women are going to Congress and more African-Americans, Latinos, uh, et cetera. Uh, and, you know, that, that, that is a very good thing, right? And that's only changed with the civil rights movement and, and new voting laws. And, and as our, our viewpoints change in society, we've become thankfully more open to it. Uh, and so uh, they are, they do look more and more like, like Americans um, and, and that's good. Definitely true. Um, have there been any like official efforts to expand Congress, you know, or lower the ratio between representatives to constituents or has it just been just commonly accepted that this is the way it's gonna be? Well, there's always talks and studies and so forth of that. Um, you know, I, I think that there's a, a danger, right? Because if you actually had one for every 30,000 people, I mean, you would have, is, is it 10,000? Is my math correct? I mean, you would have a massive, I mean, think about how hard it would be to get a deliberative body, you know, with, with 10,000 or whatever, as opposed to, you know, 435 in the House and, and 100 in, in the Senate, you know? It would be that much more difficult. So, as much as we would like it to reflect that closeness to the people and so forth, um, you know, I think there's there's sort of a you know tension there between having you know more representatives, but also having maybe too many, especially when when they they do come from among the people. And there are ways to measure you know popular will and for them to stay in touch and you know, go to events and, and meet their constituents and stay in touch with them and receive their phone calls and go out and sort of press the flesh, if you will. Um, so, you know, I, I think most are conscientious about uh, doing that, you know, in Congress. That's great. And then you made a really interesting point that I actually want to go back to. Um, you talked about technology and how that, you know, now that we have more modern technology, it's much easier for representatives to stay in touch with their constituents and like get a pulse which I've never thought about that and I thought that was a really fascinating point because obviously when it was when the, the system was founded they had none of that you know maybe writing letters but you know that's the most I can imagine or meeting people in person so could you expand on how you think uh our technology has you know changed the role of government or changed the ability of government to represent the people 
Yeah, you know, I think uh, the, the examples that we talked about already, I mean, yeah, you're right. I mean, back then it was, and it was hard to, to, to be in Philadelphia or in Washington, D.C. or what have you, hundreds and hundreds of mile of, miles away back in 1790 and know what your constituents might want on, on, to vote on, on a particular issue you know, if you're from Georgia, for example, or, or even if you were in a nearby state, it would be very difficult. Today, obviously, um, you know, we, we can um, get in contact with our representatives. I know when I was growing up, it was write a letter to your, to your congressman or congresswoman. Uh, you know, then, you know, we have with the advent of, of email um, and, and websites and, and social media, other forms of, of communication, you know, we can stay in touch, right? We can let our representatives know how we feel very quickly, right? Very instantaneously. And, and that's very good, but it also has drawbacks too, right? In the sense that, you know, sometimes you just fire off that email or fire off that social media post and you're just kind of angry about something, right? Your passions are at work, right? And that's kind of what the founders feared, right? Uh, and, and maybe that's still, that's why we, it's still just as important as ever to have representatives to, to listen to their constituents, but again, to filter those views, to, to be deliberative about them uh, and to refine and enlarge and to say, you know what? Sometimes take an issue of whatever, uh, whichever one you want to say, okay, my constituents feel a certain way and they're very passionate about it. They're very angry about it, okay? But I'm actually gonna do a courageous thing and, and maybe maybe go against that because I think you know the, the common good might be served better. So I'm their representative, but I'm also a filter. And, and I think that if they calmly sort of thought about this issue, you know, they might see that that America's better served doing this. Now, they might be wrong about that, right? Uh, or they can also uh, you know be voted out of office because of it. Maybe their constituents just don't didn't like that vote or or, or other votes too. Um, but but that's the process of, of being a representative. Um, but yeah, there, there, there's tons of different ways and include polling, uh, you know, social media, uh, you know, they watch the news on three or four screens in their office and so forth. So all that instantaneous communications has really, in, in many ways, dramatically changed how uh, representatives can, can not only st stay in touch with their constituents, but with events too. Well, great. Tova, do you have any more questions or do we want to, um, Janine, do you want to pop in or do you want me to go to uh, Jewel? Hi. Okay. Hi, everybody. Oh my gosh. I just walked up 15 flights of stairs and then I've done that twice already today. And this is my third time to walk up 15 flights of stairs. And I had two dogs with me weighing 10 pounds. So now I had 10 pounds of weight walking up 15 flights of stairs. So sorry I'm late, it took a while. Oh my gosh, okay, sorry I'm late, but it sounds like you all have been having a fabulous discussion. And uh, hello, Tony Williams and Tova and Kathy, it looks like you've been holding down the fort. Um, and can't wait to join, who I'm assuming are with us. Are they with us today? Yeah, there they are, okay. So my, I just have two quick questions. Uh, one, as to, building off of Tova's question in regard to technology and how it's changed how we are represented, represented, we had a guest at some point that I don't remember when because we've done so many shows now, but she brought up the point that television and the news now, especially the technological aspect, the 24-hour news cycle, has really made our representatives more national than state because they never focus on, I mean, and really, I, I think that's been one of the biggest detriments um, because states and the people in the states probably have very particular issues. I know that we have a young contestant on our show often who talks about the fact or when I'm giving my speeches about building, you know, writing a petition and she wants to be able to, to, uh, they want to be able to build a well or dig for a well in their backyard and they can't. And that's a very local issue. That's a very statewide issue. Um, and these are lost with technology now because the news, you know, it's a, it's a 24 hour news cycle on CNN or Fox. We're always doing stories about just what North Carolina wanted or Texas wanted or Miami wanted, then they wouldn't be representing the entire country. 
Um, and so I think that in that respect, Tony, it's really affected the, the really what the representatives are supposed to do. The district, you know, the uh, House of Representatives are supposed to represent their locality and the Senate, Senate is supposed to represent Senator in his or her state. And that's just not happening much anymore, I think, because of because, look, when they have those, as you say, those news cameras up in their offices, they're not watching local four news in, in, in uh, you know, northern North Carolina. They're watching CNN or, or Fox News. And so not only are they national, they're driving the agenda. What do you think about that? You know, I, I, hi, Janine, first of all. Um, I, you know, I think that, that that's certainly true to, to an extent. Um, everything you just said. And so I won't even I won't even repeat it because because I think I think you're onto something. I, I think that that's a concern, but I do think that in the end, uh, you know, they're still concerned with you know did they you know get the local highway, um, you know, is there going to be a, a, a you know a, a big uh, you know are, are there jobs coming to their district you know or what incentives can they give to to companies and. You know that kind of thing. You know they're still worried about local issues. They're they're still in touch with their constituents. You know about these things. And ultimately, I think I think that what you said is true. But I also think in the end, they're they're not they're playing for the national you know audience, especially if they have higher aspirations. But on the other hand, they still have to face their constituents. You know, in the, the in, in in the House, they still have to face them every two years, and they still have to persuade their constituents that that they've looked out for their interests, that that they've gotten the right projects to their to their, you know, districts and states. And so I, I think there's there's a tension there, right? And during certain times, like today. We can sort of lean in one direction or the other, but but in many ways that same tension, you know, existed 200 years ago. Uh, you know, albeit for different reasons, you know, not television and that kind of thing. Uh, but you know, e even back then they still had to, you know, represent the local will. But there were important national issues, you know, whether we should go to war with Britain or France, or whether they should pass Hamilton's financial plans, uh, you know, the response to the Whiskey Rebellion. There were still pressing national issues that, that they had to do and, and yet and, and face and, and make decisions about, but yet they still were had to be responsive to the local will. So that tension, I think, has always been there. And, and I think what you're saying is, tr is true and, and can be a danger. Um, but I do think they pay attention to to their concerns. Yeah, good point. And you know, it, the converse may be true, uh, actually, as well, and that the people in the local districts and the s local states are watching national news, mm -hmm. and so their focus doesn't really stay on the locality or the state; it stays on more of a national. Which just all of these elements, I think, uh, grow the government to to empower the government more than it would if people just stayed uh, local. And, you know, then, of course, you're right. The, when they go to the national government in D.C., they're there to, to look after more of the national aspects for, the, for their states and the state governments with their capitals and governors would. would, would, would well, that's why this, this, the, the checks and balances of local government and state government and national government is really, truly really terrific. Um, I'm looking at the time here and I want I want to move it on. So I'm going to ask a lightning question. If you could give me a lightning answer, like maybe. 45, one minute so that I don't feel like I'm hogging everybody's time because yep. um, everybody else has to get to their question. But I, I don't know if this was dealt with because I, I, I stepped in here late. But but as I was reading Brutus 3, um, so many aspects were really pretty fascinating. But it was just all of this concern about being represented properly. And what I what I thought is interesting is redistricting and districting. Um, I don't know if y'all touched on that. I know that redistrict districting, or it's hard to say districting. That is something that is you love it if it's benefiting you. Sort of like the Constitution. Everybody loves the Constitution when it benefits their party, um, and everybody loves districting when it when it benefits their win. Um, but did y'all address that at all? Because I think that that's in a way that's really helped the representatives be more specific to their area, and it wouldn't. And was that addressed in the Constitution? Because if uh, if it w I think it was a little bit about how people could vote within their I don't know to touch on that um, because uh, Brutus was concerned about that and uh, districtings I would think would really take care of that so in sixty seconds what are your thoughts about that? 
Right. Well, uh, you know, they, they took a census and and uh, districting was was, you know, and redistricting was was just a natural constitutional part of, of governing. Um, but yes, uh, he so I started to try to gain an advantage over that. And so the idea is to try to be as fair as possible. But but even back then, as you as you say, Brutus raised issues like, you know, the three fifths clause benefiting the, the southern states or uh, you know, uh, small Delaware or Rhode Island getting as much influence in, in the Senate as, as Virginia. These were these were concerns at the time, and we have similar kinds of concerns. You know, is the Congress truly representative? Can it be representative today? One every nine hundred thousand or so uh, people in the United States, as opposed to about thirty thousand back then. So yeah, we we've talked about some of these issues and some of those tensions and. Uh, you know, I, I think Brutus raises a good point. You know, he wants it to be fair. It wants it to be truly representative and, and equal. Uh, and we also want that today. Um, and so so that that's a good thing that sort of, you know, desire for equality and fairness, I think, is rooted in the American character. OK, Tony, that was really great. Uh, Ten seconds. Is districting mentioned in the Constitution or not? Uh, yeah, it, not all the specifics, but I think it, it gave the power uh, to Congress to to district in, in the wake of the census. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it is in there. And that would be an answer to Brutus, I would think, because not everybody lived in the same, not all the rich lived in the same areas as the poor. So if you're going to create districts and the poor are going to be represented and the rich are going to be represented, but at least everybody will be represented, right? Right. That, yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I think a criticism of Brutus is that it, it would be split up uh, in these different districts. And so you wouldn't, you know, the, the danger of this cabal is not maybe mm -hmm. as, as, as strong as he thought. OK, great. All right, Kathy, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Janine. Let's go to Jewel. Uh, and unfortunately, Jordan's not with us today, but I know Jewel's got some really great questions ready. And um, Jewel, we're going to let you take it away. Hi, Tony. Nice to hear you again and learn from you. This is like a graduate class on this. It's a very similar. It's, very, it's, a, it's really great. Um, I think that a lot of our listeners and me too will probably be reading Brutus and, and identifying with a lot of his concerns. Now, not for all the reasons he has them, but for uh, the realities that most people, especially those listening to the show, do not feel represented. Um, so I had I do have a bunch of questions. I'm going to try to ask them all fast, and I want to push back on some things and see how you'd answer. Um, number one, Brutus is concerned about the diversity of Congress, but he's not concerned about the diversity of those based on how they look. He's concerned about the diversity based on interest, based on mechanics, laborers, um, I don't think Congress represents me at all because I think most congressmen are either career politicians, lawyer, political science background, um, career path, mostly not made out of Congress and then run. And that's not how the founding fathers saw it. So um, as far as representing the people, I think we have a fundamentally different system of representation because their thought was being represented for who you are and what you do with those conflicting interests. Um, now our consideration of representation has more to do with some type of socioeconomic or uh, cultural um, axiom. Yeah, so, so if I'm understanding your question, you know, you know, I think that, yeah, Brutus is mostly worried about sort of uh, representing the, the various sort of interests and occupations and sort of economic interests in society. Um, you know, the, the ordinary farmer or, or craftsman as, as well as the, you know, the, the, mer the wealthy merchant. And he's afraid that the wealthy mer merchant's going to control everything. One might say that, well, the wealthy merchants, uh, in a sense, control things today, right? That it's certainly true that it, it takes, a, a, you know, a great deal of money um, to run for Congress uh, and, and people of means, you know, are able to put, uh, you know, at least some, you know, their, their own money in, into to running and so forth. Um, and... And you sort of have this millionaire's pod. That they, where are 
we're the more ordinary Americans, right? Does, does it, you know, what, why is it a lot of Harvards and Yales and Princetons and that kind of thing? And a lot of just uber successful people where are, you know, as you say, might say the, the act, you know, the actors and the farmers and the teachers and, and, you know, the rest of us who, uh, you know, are, are, are getting by, you know, in the middle class. You know, that, that's that been, you know, something that, that's certainly evolved over time, particularly, uh, you know, with the House of Representatives, you know, campaigns have cost more and more money. Uh, and, and I think you're right that it's had a, a negative impact upon, you know, uh, the sort of the face of Congress that even as it's become more diverse, maybe in terms of women and men, African-Americans, Hispanics, and so forth, uh, they still almost look like each other financially, right, and, and to, to a certain extent. Um, and, and, and that is troubling, right, because that's kind of Brutus's fear, right? Uh, maybe in some ways that's come to fruition. And a lot of people, you know, see the anti-federalists as, as sort of foreseeing a lot of the problems that, that would emerge from, from this. Um, not quite sure how to change that. Uh, and, and I'm open to push back on, on any of the points I've made. Um, but, but yeah, it, it's troubling, right? Because to have, a, to have a true sense of the people, you know, you, you need to come from among them. And, and I think your question is basically getting at the fact that maybe they, you just don't feel like they're really representing us. Like, let's have yeah, more teachers, also, let's have more firemen, you know, let's have whatever. And I also don't know if it would have to be those who are in those occupations, but they don't, we don't even have our political system where they run on representing the major occupation and interests of their constituents, because those, those different occupations have conflicting interests. So the way that the system is designed is that many conflicting interests create the tension to get the common denominator of what's best for most people. So we have a lot of, I live in Pennsylvania. So we have a lot of lip service about um, manufacturing, uh, former coal workers, um, former steel workers, and those types of jobs and what to do with the, with the decline in them and, and what now. But even though there's lip service, there's not even a direct saying, we represent you. Mm -hmm. um, my great grandfather worked Bethlehem Steel for 42 years, and Bethlehem Steel is one of the largest steel manufacturers in the world. It was, um, and went under, and a lot of people lost their pensions. And now, where I live is done well, but the whole thought process is so much more like a kind of what Janine had said run on national issues and some local issues to just say it, but we rarely ever get. Um, any type of hey the people who live here want this that's not even that's not even the language I've ever heard used and I've sat in a lot of uh, congressmen offices growing up and talking to them and and they don't even try to use that language yeah you know I, I, I think that would be uh, you know I think that's troubling to the extent that it's true I think that uh, in in most districts one does need to pay attention right in other words you don't want to you know go to go to coal country or 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 you know the oil country and 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 support shutting down a pipeline right or or not not getting any more coal out of the ground and just you know switching to, to clean energy or, or what have you i mean running it directly against your constituents interests and desires you know, is maybe sometimes courageous and sometimes necessary, but doing it that blatantly, uh, just because you think it's just better for the country or whatever, um, as you say, running on national interests as opposed to local issues, is probably a good way not to win, uh, you know, and, and I guess what you're saying, you know, the lip service, you know, I, I'm not sure the, the American people are really that that dumb, you know, I think that they can see through a lot of this and, and see whether they are representatives or senators should see this is the problem, though, to the extent that they even know who they are, right, you know, if we're, if we don't even know who they are, we can't hold them accountable for truly representing our interests. And if we don't go vote, you know, if 10% of us or 13% of us are voting and off year congressional election, 
then we kind of kind of get the representatives we deserve, you know, um, maybe not. I think it's the ones it's hard want, to you know? it is hard, though, to run against the that machine, though, because we're conditioned everywhere we look to care about certain issues. So when you go to the ballot, when you go to the polls, you're thinking about those issues. And even if you have these local interests, you don't think of your congressman as directly to represent you as much as because if I go on YouTube right now, there's going to be banners about all of these things. And if I go on Facebook, there's going to be banners and ads about these things. And when I go to college in my classroom, there's going to be banners about these same things. And then on the news, they're going to be arguing about those same things. And never will the things in my own region be discussed anywhere in my life. So where would I even have the understanding that those are things that my congressmen were designed to be running and caring about? Yeah, no, I, and I, I wild I up and pit against each other on these other issues. Yeah, no, I understand. And, you know, as we as Tova mentioned, we all look to the president to solve all our problems or to make all these decisions. Right. And 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 all of, of his or her bureaucracy. Right. All, all the agencies. This is problematic. Everything you're saying is troubling and problematic and, and you know, to a certain extent, true. Uh, and. You know, I think it, it starts with good civics education, like Constituting America is is doing day in and day out, and and uh, we at the Bill of Rights Institute, it's just, just to become more educated. You know, the citizenry, the founders said this again and again, and they all agreed on the same thing: we have to have an educated, enlightened citizenry and a virtuous citizenry, or this Republican form of government is just not going to work. And, and everything you just said, I, I think is rooted uh, in many ways in, in popular ignorance for, for, for one reason or another. And you, you know, we're the ones to change that because we live in a Republic. And if we're just gonna defer to it, if we're not gonna vote, if we're gonna be ignorant about who actually makes these decisions, if we don't even know who our you know, Congress people are, then, you know, I, then I don't know what to say, you know, and then, then we're in trouble, right? But we have to start understanding why the first branch of government is so important and then act accordingly, right? I, I think mean, just the knowledge isn't enough. We have to act accordingly in terms of voting and being in touch with them, holding them accountable, et cetera, et cetera. So I have one more question, but what I take from what you're saying is basically that, um, no matter what system we had that it can't make up for the citizenry not doing their part. I think it's rooted in that. Right. I, and I'm not blaming the people by any means. Right. Uh, I'm from among them. Um, you know, but, but we are the government, right? The first branch of government is the most important branch of government. They represent us directly and, and we are the sovereign people. Right. And we need to, take a more active role in all of this. And, and we need to take part in our government. We need to run, you know, you young people that I'm talking to and are watching and, uh, you know, the teachers are, run for office, right? Uh, you know, we, if, we, we're the people, you know, it, it comes down to that. Again, just sort of no matter how you put it, we the people in order to form a more perfect union. You know, it, it's, our founding documents are awash in the idea that we're creating a republic, okay? And so we are ultimately responsible for the kind of government we have. And, and if they're not really representing our interests, as you're saying, then we need to hold them accountable. And there's a lot of different ways to do that. And, and one really good way is to run for office. <laughs> That's a great answer, Tony, and great questions, Jewel. Thank you so much. I wanna make sure we get to some of our audience questions today. We have a question and a comment from Cal Robbins. Uh, Cal says, a question and a comment from an anti-federalist. The question is, what is the purpose of governments instituted among men that is found in the Declaration of Independence? And then Cal also included a quote from Patrick Henry, which is, you are not to inquire how your trade may be increased nor how you are to become a great and powerful people, but how your liberties can be secured. For liberty ought to be the direct end of your government, Patrick Henry. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think the the answer to the declaration is that government was instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, kind of the point of today's discussion. And, you know, it's, it's, it's basic job is to protect the liberties of the people, right? Uh, and to govern wisely and so forth and to reflect that will of the people. Um, and yeah, so the, so the Patrick Henry quote, I think is, is extremely relevant to that very important point that Jefferson, you know, says, uh, it, you know, it's based upon consensual government, free government, and, and we are the people and they are representatives, right? Great. Uh, Tony, Lori Berg asks, why do you think they didn't include term limits in the in the Constitution? I'm, yeah, in the Constitution. Yeah, but I, you know, I think that they they wanted, they, I think they expected a greater rotation of office, right? I'm not sure that they really recognize kind of the power of incumbency. And, and the, we probably don't have time to go into all the different ways that an incumbent can can be powerful and, and use their office to get reelected. Okay, we don't have time for quite all that. But, it, you know, it's very, very powerful and it's very hard uh, to get, you know, for a new person to, to get elected in, into Congress. It's just simply um, the way that, that it is. Um, but I, I think that they wanted people to be able to run for reelection because they wanted them to acquire the requisite sort of experience for the job. I, I, I think that they thought this was important, but I, I think that they thought that, you know, as, you know, interest change and world events change and so forth, that, that there would be a greater rotation of, in office. I think that the Federalists and, uh, and anti-Federalists might be a little troubled by, you know, incumbency today, but, but even today, right, there, there are moments uh, like in '94 and 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 at other times where there there is or there are a lot of new faces in Congress and and that can shake things up uh, quite a bit um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing uh, so you know I think the founders wanted you know that these representatives who are filtering the will of the people to and refining and enlarging them to also you know, be able to lend their experience um, and, and, and serve the Republic, right? Uh, you know, we, we forget that the founding fathers like Jefferson and, and Washington, Madison and, and so forth, Hamilton, and they could have done other things. And, and Hamilton could have been a very, very rich lawyer, um, for example, but chose to serve the Republic, you know? Um, and while he didn't serve in the Congress itself, um, you know, I think they wanted to allow those experienced and, 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 you know, wise people to, to run for office and be reelected. Thank you. And our board member, Jay McConville is watching today and Jay has a question. Over the last several decades, there have been concerns that current legislators are subject to passing legislation that they know to be constitutionally problematic because it pleases their constituencies under the expectation that the Supreme Court will clean that up. In other words, Congress is passing off their responsibilities for constitutionality to less publicly sensitive courts. Do you agree with this charge? Did the founders anticipate this possibility? Are there any provisions to prevent this? You know, there's, there's a tension there, right? We want representatives to represent the will of the people, right? Um, and, but we also want them to act constitutionally. <laughs> Okay, I, I, you know, I think that there's probably some uh, merit to a, at least some, if not a lot of merit to to what he's what he's asking what, what he's arguing. Um, but, you know, I think that there, there's a, a deeper uh, problem actually involved that, you know, with this idea of, of the living constitution, I think with with these sort of new constitutional theories that are out there that and, and the living constitution basically means that you know, it evolves, it changes over time. It, it Essentially, it can mean what I want it to mean, right? So we don't necessarily need to be bound by this, this text of this fundamental law of this country. I think that's really, in many ways, the deeper issue, that, that people just want to do what, and, and, and to give them credit, I think people are trying to do what they think is best for the country, um, but are, are sort of untroubled by constitutional text. I, I think that's just a, a broad problem in general is a, is a lack of constitutional understanding. And I think they actually think they're acting constitutionally. 
Um, and, and that's even more troubling. That's even more, that's even scarier. Well, thank you. And I want to read a, a quick comment from Nikki Coons. I know we only have about one minute left, but uh, Nikki says, hello, thank you for doing this and allowing me to join a little backstory of myself. I'm a commissioner of my county, and I don't recall learning this when I was in school. I do not have children in school, however. My question would be, how would a parent check with the school's curriculum to see if this is being taught in our schools and being taught correctly? What types of questions would the parent need to ask to get the answer? And Tony, I know you taught uh, for years uh, and with your activity at the Bill of Rights Institute, what, do you have any advice uh, for Nikki? Yeah, I mean, as far as I know, uh, you know, the public school curriculum should be public. Uh, they should be um, available. Uh, and, and at private schools, uh, they should be willing to share it with you uh, in, unless they're trying to hide something. Um, and so you should be able to, to look at the curriculums, no matter where your school is, 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 where your children are going to school. And, you know, you should be able to raise questions and, and to look through their civics curriculum and, and see what's being taught. And actually, just as an example, you know, with critical race theory, I think, I think a lot of parents actually are doing that. Uh, and, and I think, you know, I won't wade into that discussion with 30 seconds left, uh, but, but I will say that it's, it's great to see that parents are actually looking to see what's being taught and, and having an active voice in, in their community schools. I mean, that's, you know, these, these schools are part of the community. They're not out there somewhere. Right, and that's very important. Well, thank you. And I wanna thank uh, everybody else that we oh. didn't get to today. And we're gonna to go to Janine um, to, to close because we're right at time. So Janine. Oh yeah, what a good show. I was really a great show. I, I just love the way we have this format here and Tony, terrific. And, but it's just wonderful, isn't it? For the audience, just to know that we have Jewel and uh, Jorn when he's with us and Tova to ask these questions and Kathy and our audience ask questions. It's really cool. Jorn, I want to build, uh, Jewel, I want to build on something that you said in closing. You know, I understand what you're saying. It's, it's like uh, all these other issues are being dealt with, but what about my issues? And I, it reminds me of the story when I, and I've told this before, but uh, when I was at the uh, convention, the Republican convention, and there was this, this sort of red carpet of, of cameras, and they were trying to say, hey, Janine Turner's here, and she'd like to talk, and she wants to talk about the Constitution, and nobody was biting, and, and they, they, Kathy was standing right by me. They came back to me and said, um, listen, the Constitution, it, you know, it's just not very sexy. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, can, can, you, can you talk about something that's just a little sexier? And I'm like, oh my gosh. And Jewel, you know, I know what it's like when you have these, what, where, what we have to do is also, correl I'm correlating with what Tony's answer was, but it's like, we have to be loud. We have to be as loud as these banners that you keep talking about that are everywhere. And, and to do that, we have to unite and, and be loud. And not only that, we have to find, and we do this all the time with promoting our shows. We have to find a sexy way to promote it. And we had to find a way to promote it that affects you, you that particular person, it's because of the, it's the squeakiest wheel that's going to get heard. And I, I think that that so not only do we have to, to unite and become just as loud as they are, but we have to find a sexy way to do it. That's the first thing I want to say. And the second thing, what I'll say about Congress and the way that, that, that it, there's this is an interesting thought to think about to close. The minute I think about those congressmen and women that stay there forever and forever and forever and forever, I mean, part of it is, yes, they're doing great things for the country and, and the more wisdom is good. I'm a little on the fence with this. However, we just pay them so much money. I mean, I don't know that our founding fathers, when the Constitution was written, expected our found, the, the representatives to be making so much money. Um, they had to, they could only go for a few years, a term or two, and then they had to go back to work. Um, so that's a thought. But the converse side of that is, if they didn't make money, would only the rich be representing us because they could afford to do so. So there are two sides to that coin to think about as we close. So anyway, I guess we all just have to find a way to, to, to make sure that our constitution and, and, and the, to the parent that, that wants to know what's going on. I mean, we, that's what we try to do. We go into schools and, and uh, school after school, Kathy has all the figures. I mean, I think I've given over 500, 600 speeches to try to just make it uh, the constitution just practical and applicable and respectable to people and not a political issue. 
Um, but once again, is that sexy? And how do we, how do, what's our banner, you know, to go in there and fight, fight the fight. And it's, uh, it's, 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 it's pretty, it's pretty interesting, but the louder we are, the, and the more of a hook we have to our cause, the better representation we'll have and the more our issues will be heard. Anywho, that's all I have to say in closing. Well, thank you so much. And thank you to everyone for joining us. Uh, I want to remind everyone that uh, one month from today is Constitution Day. And that is the deadline for your We the Future contest entry. So please spread the word to all the young people in your life. We have categories for all ages from elementary school, kindergarten, all the way up to grad school, law school, even some senior citizen uh, categories and, and a few adult categories. So just go to our website and look on the banner and drop down where it says scholarship and contest and encourage everyone to enter. Uh, next week, we're going to be talking about the second branch, the Senate. Tuesday, uh, August 24th at 2 p.m. Eastern. So we hope that you'll join us and um, just thank you all very much. Tony, is there well, anything? We, we, also, we also have workshops on Constitution Day. Did you just say that and I zoned out? I, or were you talking about the contest only? Because we, we have a great workshop from 1045 to 345 with the students actually teaching other students the Constitution in their cultural field. We do. And just you can go on our website and sign up for that as well. Constitution Day, the 17th. Yep. Okay. Well, thank y'all. Have a great rest of the day. See you next week. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, everyone. Bye.